We are super glad to be here this morning. Uh, I know everybody's wide awake. Uh, everybody went to bed at their normal time last night and realized that something happened in the middle of the night and somebody stole something from you, right? I, I had purposely, as I told the kids, I had purposely set our manual clocks up earlier in the afternoon so I wouldn't forget. And so, but every time you look at your watch or look at the, the, your screen you were on or maybe or whatever, the time was different. And it threw everybody in the house off except for me. I knew because I had done it. And so I even tried to go to bed a little earlier last night to prepare for this morning. Uh, but then my dog got me up even earlier than what I intended to. So it just all went uh, nowhere for any good. So get your Bibles. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. Uh, we're continuing on with our fundamentals uh, series, if you want to call it that, uh, sermon uh, series there that God's laid on our heart to take us through. Uh, today we want to deal with faith, repentance, and grace. Faith, repentance, and grace. Now we've kind of hit on a couple of these things uh, through this already, but today we want to look at the thought and remind you that these all go together. They all go together. It's kind of like a, a car. You know, your car has an engine, a transmission, and those cannot work by themselves and move the car. If you've got an engine with no car and a car with no engine, neither one of them are going to move at all unless you move them manually. But when you put a car with an engine, with a working transmission, with everything else it needs to have in it, and then put gas in it, or as today goes along, or for they're trying to, electrify it. You can make it go then, because everything has to go together. When we look at these three, these three things are all gifts from God. Faith, repentance, and grace. They're all gifts from God. Each one can stand on their own. In, in the spiritual realm, they can stand on their own. But when they come together, they magnify each other. They magnify each other. When, you, when God gives you faith and then you repent, then you can understand the grace of God even greater than what you started at. Faith, it draws us to repentance. It draws us to repentance. When we repent... We experience the fullness of God's grace when we repent. So we get your Bibles, Acts 2, verse 32. Let's stand and read uh, this together. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, for your homework this week, I would like for you to read the entire book of Acts. No, uh, the entire of chapter 2. 2 of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to pick up at verse 32 though, and Peter says in his sermon, God has raised this Jesus, we are all witnesses of this, therefore since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared, sit to, declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know that with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask now, God, that you'd bless your word 
and put your words in our mouth to give to your people. God, increase our faith. Uh, God, manifest the faith you've given us in our lives. God, help us to be repentant people. And God, help us to relish and be thankful for your grace, but also to extend that grace to others and to proclaim your grace to a lost and dying world. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that you're going to send him back someday. And I pray, God, that everybody in this place will be ready to meet you when you come. And Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask again if there's anybody here lost today in this place, that you'd speak to them, that you would save their soul from hell today and give them eternal life. We love you and praise you and give you all, all in glory. In Christ's name we pray, and amen. You may be seated. May God bless his word this morning. Faith, repentance, and grace. When we think about these things, faith draws us to God. Now, I know when we think about faith, uh, people are drawn to God, we know, by the Holy Spirit of God. We, God's Holy Spirit draws. And when we look at all these things, when you look at the entire book or entire chapter 2 of the book of Acts, we see that God calls these people together. The, the disciples are all in the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes like a rushing wind and uh, cloving tongues of fire light up on them and they're able to speak in other languages and, and such as nature. An amazing event that took place that day. But God called people to witness what was going on. He drew them there. People said, well, these people are crazy, they're drunk. And, and Peter says, no, 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 they're not drunk. This is the fulfillment of Scripture. It's what Joel spoke about in the Old Testament. And as Peter stood up to preach, God began to convict the people of their sins. He also then gave them hope of this in his sermon. Peter gave them hope through the Word of God. And he called them to repent. He forgave those who repented of their sins and he changed their lives. Who did that? Was it Peter? Was it the apostles? It was God who did this. When anyone comes to faith in Jesus, God has done everything to save that person. He's done everything. Yeah, he may have used you or you or you or me, but he is the one who has done it. He is the one who receives the glory. He's the one who receives the praise. He is the one who has the authority to forgive sins. I can't forgive your sins. Now, if you wrong me or I wrong you, we can forgive each other, but I can't forgive your sins against God, and you can't forgive my sins against God. Only Jesus can, and he does when we repent. Faith draws us to God. When the Holy Spirit came on the believers... Thousands came together because, guess what? They were there, they had been there for Passover, and now they're there for Pentecost. They're there to experience a Jewish festival that happened every year. They're there to worship God, to be around the temple, to be there to worship, to be with their brothers and sisters. Suddenly, God shows up as he had promised, and things got a little crazy. Because all these other Jewish people had come from other regions and they had different dialects, different languages. And suddenly these apostles of Jesus are out proclaiming the goodness of God and they're speaking in other languages. And it's possible that the other people were just hearing what they were saying in their own languages too. And they think, this is crazy. What is going on? Let's go check it out and see. The Holy Spirit was moving in that place. Peter and the other apostles, they stood up and they began to proclaim what was happening. Uh, they weren't drunk. <laughs> they weren't crazy. They weren't lunatics. They had been filled by the Holy Spirit of God as it had been promised. In verse 17 of Acts 2, And it shall be in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all people. On all people. God was fulfilled His word there that day in Jerusalem. And faith was drawing people to God. Now, they didn't just suddenly come up with the faith on their own. No, God gave them the faith. God put the faith in their hearts to draw them to him. You've heard my testimony if you've been here in the length of time. I was saved at the age of nine years old. Yeah, I wasn't a, a murderer. 
an adulterer, a drug addict, uh, an embezzler. I want none of those things yet. You notice I said yet? We all become those things later on in life, don't we, it seems. Now, I can't think of anything I've embezzled, but, you know, I, I'd have to really pin down on anybody I've murdered and committed adultery with and all this other stuff. You know, we have to pin it down, kind of look at what have I done here, you know? But I can, have, I can stand up here today and list a whole lot of sins. Pride, lust, deception, a whole lot of sins that I could list down for me, for you, but that's not what we're here today for. I was at the age of nine years old. I realized that I had disobeyed my parents. I had done things that were wrong. But the most important thing is I had done something wrong against God. Anytime I lied, anytime I did anything wrong, I wasn't necessarily doing it against anybody else. I was sinning against God. David learned that lesson too. When David realized he had sinned, he said, Against you, Lord, I have sinned. Against you, I have committed this great trespass. Against you, God, I've sinned. I was convicted of that at the age of nine. I didn't suddenly have faith on my own. God gave me the faith. And when the invitation time came, I was told that I could come and that my sins could be forgiven. And I came, and they were, and I've never been the same. These people are experiencing the exact same thing. Same thing with you when you came to faith in Christ. I don't care how old you were. You didn't suddenly decide today, I think I'll be saved today. No, God was working on you, putting faith into you to draw you to him at the proper time. The proper time, his time, not your time, his time. I would love to save everyone in this place today that hasn't yet been. And that's why my prayer is that God will save them today. If it's not today, then maybe tomorrow. But it is all about God. God draws people to him, to his son, through his son, through his Holy Spirit. See, it's all about God to give them the assurance of faith the measure of faith that they need to say, okay, I believe in the message that these men are preaching today. These people saw the signs. They had heard about Jesus. They would heard he was a miracle worker. They would heard him teach. They would heard the chief priest proclaim him as an as a anti-Messiah, false Messiah. They had sold him out to the Romans, lied about him crucified him but now these people are saying he's alive again and something began to happen the Holy Spirit came and began to magnify the message of what the apostles were saying Peter wrote and said to them in verse 22 fellow Israelites listen to these words this Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. That's where Peter puts, he just lays it out there. You killed him. Now, let's, let, me, let me get into the equation of this, okay? I can't point fingers at you. All right? I have to turn around and point fingers at all of us. We put Jesus on the cross. It was our sins that he took there to the cross and paid for. Mine and yours. All of us. These people in this passage of Scripture, every human being that's ever lived, living now or will live, Jesus took our sins to the cross to pay for them there. Faith then draws us to the knowledge that we are sinners. Faith draws us to the knowledge that we are the ones who killed Jesus. No, I didn't physically hammer the nails, physically do anything to him, but I've spiritually done it to him. He died for me before I was even born. That's the amazing thing about Jesus. He loved me so much that he died for me even knowing what I would do. 
How often do you chew on that? I don't get steak very often, okay? But when I get a good steak, I don't just take two chews on it and swallow it. When I get a really good piece of cheesecake, I don't just scarf it down so fast you never knew it was on my plate. You know what I do? I savor it. I chew on it. I let it soak up in my mouth a little bit. You know, just get all the extra flavor, all the extra juice or whatever it might be, and savor it. Our little nephew, great nephew now, he's what he is, he would, for a while, he would go, ah, you ever done that with the Word of God? You ever done that with the knowledge that Jesus died for you before you were even born? And that every sin you've committed, he paid for on the cross before you even did them? You got to chew on that for a while. You know? You got to let that just marinate in your mouth. You got to just chew on that for a while. God draws people to his son by his spirit. And gives them the measure of faith to believe. Once faith draws, once faith convicts us of our sins, then God offers us the out, the way out, repentance. Repentance clears us before God. See, if all we had is faith and never got to repentance, would that be enough? No, it would not. If once you get faith, the next step is repenting. And then when you repent, your faith blows up and magnifies itself. Because you have come to Jesus and you've admitted that you're a sinner. You've confessed your sin before him and you've asked him to forgive you for sin and you walk away from it. You've repented and you've received his forgiveness. And your faith, is, has been, your faith was put to the test and it passed. Look what happens. When they, in verse 37, when they heard this, that they were the ones who killed him, but that Jesus wrote, ra raised him up from the dead, verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know the certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? The message of Jesus exposes our sins. Why, why, why does the scripture say men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil? They don't want to be seen, right? Now we've got what everywhere? Cameras, right? Everywhere you go, there's cameras. They, they, there's a guy at work that they joke with him because he bought a new truck not too long ago, and it's got like 15 cameras on it. Everything in blind spot cameras, backup cameras, front view cameras, side. They got cameras everywhere. And he still can't back. They, that's how they aggravate. He still can't back the thing in the spot, you know? That's how they aggravate him with it, you know? There's cameras everywhere. But still things are hidden, but not from God, right? We can't hide anything from him. The word of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the word of God exposes our sin. But that's the best thing about it. When it exposes our sin, you, you, when you get a cut, you, you don't pour salt in the wound, right? Because it hurts. Well, you can use it to cleanse with, you know. Uh, back in my day, you older folks like me, mercurochrome was the, was the everything. You just put a little mercurochrome on there and go on, right? You know? Rub it on there, you'll be all right. When Jesus exposes your sins, he cuts you open and he doesn't insert something that's harmful. What he inserts in there when he exposes your sin is faith. And when the faith gets in that wound, it draws that faith out to repentance. That's what God does. He exposes us to our sin, or exposed to him. He slices us open, inserts faith in there, and out comes repentance. That's how it works. When faith springs up, we can't help but confess our sins. When God gets a hold of you and you've sinned and you've done wrong and you've been convicted of it, 
And, and God says, okay, you just need to confess it, Paul. And you do. Man, what a great day it is. Because all what happens is that wound suddenly is no longer exposed. It's closed. Because when you repent of it, the wound is healed. Hey, ain't that awesome? And you don't have to walk around with a bandage for weeks and months either. You know, you don't have to. Because you're forgiven. Confession. Confession lays our sins out before us. Now, I mentioned earlier, I could list all my sins up here. And they could be, they could be labeled all Ten Commandments. I've done all of them. Broke all ten of them. Well, you're not killing nobody. Not, not lit, literally, but... And you've done the same thing, too. Don't look at me like, he's a pastor and he wanted somebody dead. Just like you. You're just like me. There are people I don't like, but now I've matured. I don't want them dead. I want them in heaven with me. Then I'll lock them there. Do you, you, you see what I mean? There are people that don't like me here. Not Maybe not here, but in this world. They don't like me. But if they meet Jesus, guess what? They'll like me in heaven. We'll get along there. Mm. Confession lays our sins out before us. Repentance then comes. Repentance then comes as we turn away from our sins. So repentance is simply turn it away. Think about this. I'm not going to move anything, but think about it. if I took that chair. Let's just move it. I said I want you to move anyway. This chair is my sin. And I carry it around me everywhere I go. And you would think I was an idiot, right? If I carry this chair everywhere I went. But this is my sin. I carry it. I got to carry it. God says, hey, Paul, what are you doing carrying that chair around for? It's my sin. I got to carry it. Jesus says, no, Paul, lay the chair down. I'll take care of it. What am I going to do? Hey, you can have the chair. I don't want it no more. I don't go back and pick the chair up again. I turn away from the chair. I turn away from my sin because I don't want to pick it back up. But how many people have done this? We've repented of our sin, and, but then we like it so much we go back and get the chair. Hmm? How many times have you ever drove, if you drive through Hamlet County, you go through any side street in Hamlet County, you'll find somebody has laid out a sofa, love seat, refrigerator or something all over Hamlet County. You come back the next day, and it most likely won't be there. You know why? Somebody's, oh, look at that. It's mine now, you know? Don't go picking up somebody else's sin either. Especially don't go back and pick up your own sin. Repentance means you've turned away from it. If that's my sin back there, I'm not going back and picking it up again. I don't want to. And, but, you know, you're tempted to. I know we all are tempted to. But we got to be repentant people on a consistent basis. When we repent, our faith magnifies. Our faith grows. And when our faith grows, guess what happens? Our repentant heart grows. Do you see? They magnify each other. They get better. They get stronger. And then grace. Grace becomes more and more sweeter as our faith and our repentance grows. Turning away from sin faces us before God, and therefore we receive his cleansing. And then grace reveals the riches of God. Look what Peter tells him. They ask him, what do we do? What do we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized. Repent. He says, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The best gift I've ever gotten is the Holy Spirit. Best thing. Best thing. He is constantly my companion. He is constantly with me, in me, strengthening me, guiding me, convicting me, encouraging me. He is always there. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Even when I want to pick up my sin, 
The Holy Spirit says, Paul, what are you doing? Don't do that. Yes, Lord, I won't. And then he magnifies. After faith and repentance are manifested, we then begin to see more clearly the grace of God. The other night, actually it was yesterday morning, I got up my normal time, and when I get up, if the dog isn't already up, the dog gets up, and I got to take the dog out. Well, I had laid down my glasses somewhere, and I had no idea where I laid them down at. So, in the house, I was fine. I knew where I was going. Everything was as well as can be for me to see without my glasses or my contacts in. And I was doing okay. But man, when I got outside, I'm thinking, I got to watch what I'm doing, you know? Because I had eight cars in my driveway suddenly, you know? There were two, two or three light poles in my yard. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? I realized I didn't have my glasses on. I didn't see clearly. But when I got back in, I finally remembered where I put them at the night before. And I put them on, and I could see clearly. The glasses helped my eyes focus on what I was seeing. That's what faith and repentance, when they come together, do about God's grace. When you repent, when your faith grows, and you have your repentant heart grow, God's grace gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. It does. You think about it, you forgave me of this. Why? How could you? And he reminds me, I did it because I love you. I love you. Jesus loves you today. His riches, look, I wrote a few of them down here. His riches of forgiveness, love, provision, and promise become clearer and clearer as we live a repentant life and he grows our faith. And as our faith and our repentant heart grows, as grace becomes more evident in our lives, we love him even more. Even more. This is the riches of God. Paul, Peter says, you're going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look what else they got. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's writing to the church there in Ephesus. And we're, we're hurriedly coming to a close. You better hang on, get the last part here. Ephesians 2, listen to this. This is where these people on the day of Pentecost were at. This is where you were at until you met Jesus. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So listen up. Catch it. If you don't catch it, you've, you've not, you're going to miss out. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Peter tells them, repent, be baptized, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's enough. That's enough. But we get so much more through Jesus Christ. He says this, verse 6 again of Ephesians 2. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Yeah. 
we're, 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 we're kind of getting a taste of that now. You know, we're kind of getting a little sample taste of what heaven's going to be like when we're all there together in heaven rejoicing the one who, over the one who died for us and we're all free from sin. There's no animosity, no anger, no hatred, no dislike. Those are all gone and dead. Where there's no lust, there's nothing, uh, no desires of the flesh to fulfill. We're all there with peace and in joy and in love with God. Then he says this, verse 7, so that in the coming ages, that means future, that means yet to come, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I've never had an immeasurable amount of time. I've never had an immeasurable amount of talent. I've never had an immeasurable amount of money. But I'm going to have an immeasurable eternal life with Jesus. Where the money won't matter, where the talent won't matter, and where there is no end of our time. I've joked about this, but I mean it seriously when I joke about it. Someday, when I get to heaven, I will be able to sing. And it won't matter if it's in tune or out of tune there. You'll only hear it in tune. Because I will be singing the praises of the one who died for me, experiencing the immeasurable riches of his love for me. Do you have that in store for you? Do you have faith? Have you repented? Have you experienced God's grace? These people, when they heard the message of Jesus, they asked Peter, what do we do? Peter says, Repent. God had already sprung up the faith in them and convicted them. Now he was drawing them to repent. Notice what happened. 3,000 of them that day repented of their sins and were baptized that day. Names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Grace. Grace exceeded their sins. Do you see? Grace far outweighed their sins because God's grace is immeasurable. Our sins have a limit. Our sins, yeah, may be many, but God's grace is greater than all of our sins. Have you experienced that today? If not, what are you waiting on? <laughs> what are you waiting on? You're, you're waiting on it to be uh, 65 and 70 degrees outside on a, on a, Sunday, on a Sunday morning. Are you waiting for it to be snowing again? Are you waiting for, for the, the stars to align in the sky? Everything's aligned right now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Don't wait. Get it right with Christ today. Repent. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your, the privilege of knowing you, of being with you, of experiencing your grace. God, I pray for those who are here today that may have never have experienced your grace, that you would speak to them this morning. God, convict them of their sins, draw them out of their sins, show them how much you love them. God, give them the faith to believe, the faith to confess. And God, save their souls from hell. And God, help them to experience your great grace. Father, we love you and praise you. God, we just give you this time. We give you your word. We give you these people. Father, do what you need to now according to your gracious will. In Christ's name we pray. And amen. Let's get a song if you need to come.